Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Joe Cannon Health Podcast. That's a great name for a podcast, if I do say so myself, because I am Joe Cannon. I'm an exercise physiologist, and if this is your very first time listening to me, welcome. This is my attempt to bring clarity, if you will, to the world of health and fitness and wellness and nutrition. Each week, I'll talk about a different topic related to exercise, health, dietary supplements, rhabdomyolysis, you name it, pretty much everything under the sun. And my attempt here is to bring clarity to all these things, as I like to say, making them relevant, clinically relevant, um, but also taking out a lot of the big $3 words as much as I possibly can. I'm a rubber meets the road kind of guy, so I don't like to use a lot of convoluted language when I explain this, because I think that just muddies the waters a bit. And so uh, basically each week I'm going to try to, again, educate you a little bit about health and wellness, and this week will not be any different. This week has actually been an interesting week, by the way, because by the time some of you have uh, or are listening to me, um, I will probably be teaching a online course on uh, exercise-induced rhabdomyolysis, which if you have listened to previous episodes, you know that that's a topic that I do like to speak a lot about. It's a disorder where you exercise so much your muscle fibers break down, and that could actually be quite serious. Uh, several people actually have wound up in a hospital because of this condition. So I'll be talking uh, for about four hours on that uh, on, a, on an online conference call. And that'll be uh, on May 1st, probably. Well, I find May 1st is when this episode actually drops. The other thing that actually happened this week that uh, some of you may know, some of you may not know, is I am a year older. Yes, I had a birthday this week, and uh, he asked me how old I am, and I will tell you, well, younger than I am, and I'll put it, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, it is funny how aging kind of creeps up on you, and I don't really feel as old as I am, but I'll leave it at that, and I'm sure some of you probably feel the same way. But I bring this up because I got a call this week on my birthday from uh, my niece, uh, my niece, Wendy, who is 16 years old, who actually told me during uh, our phone conversation that she has shingles. And uh, that's what really prompted this week's episode. I want to talk about shingles and share with you some of the things that I told her when we were uh, talking on the telephone. So that's going to be the main topic this week, uh, shingles and how you might reduce your risk of getting shingles. Again, if this is your first time hanging out with me, uh, welcome. Uh, I usually like to start off my episodes by busting a myth of the week, as I like to call it, and this week is no different. So the myth of the week I want to talk about is actually a question that I was asked recently, and it, it was basically asked to me like this. Is it true that carbonated beverages, carbonated water, if you will, is not as good as, say, regular tap water when it comes to hydration? So the idea is, is that the carbonation of the fluid, the bubbles, if you will, would interfere with the absorption and lead to you not being as well hydrated after exercise. So I was pretty sure I knew the answer to this one. And fortunately, there is a little bit of research to back up my conclusions. Researchers basically took eight healthy guys. These were um, probably college students. That's where a lot of these uh, research studies tend to get done in colleges because they have a, a wide variety of people who are willing to put themselves uh, under exercise conditions to test stuff. So essentially the researchers, they uh, took these eight guys and they put them in a hot box uh, under four different, basically four different times. And they had them exercise on a bike at about 50% of their maximum ability. The goal here was to dehydrate them to the point that they lost about 4% of their body weight. So basically you get the idea here, they put them in this hot box and they cranked up the temperature and they had them ride a bike until they sweated off about 4% of their body weight. 
After exercise, these researchers gave these guys four different liquid solutions uh, at, at different intervals. And basically what they wanted to do is they wanted to basically rehydrate them. So they wanted to give them the same amount of fluid that they sweated off their body. All right. And so basically that would uh, bring your body weight back to what it was before they got in the hot box and exercised. So those four different solutions were, one was a non-carbonated uh, glucose fructose sugar solution. Basically your run of the mill sports drink that you get at any supermarket or convenience store. Uh, the other one was a carbonated version of essentially a sports drink. And then the third uh, category, the third uh, solution they had, him con they had him drink was a carbonated non-calorie solution. So there's no calories in this solution. And then the other one, the final solution they had him drink uh, was a non-carbonated non-calorie solution, uh, which is basically water. <laughs> so essentially they were, con they were comparing water to carbonated water, whether or not it had calories or not. So what did they actually find when they did this? Well, it, it should come as no surprise that there was no difference in how well these different fluids rehydrated people. It doesn't matter whether they drank regular water, a sports drink, or whether that sports drink had calories or it didn't have any calories. It didn't matter. All the different fluids that they ingested rehydrated them to the same degree. So myth busted. If you like carbonated beverages, great. If you like drinking water after exercise, great. They're both fine. You don't have to worry about any of that. The only thing I would say, however, is that if you are exercising, I would say that water during exercise is probably better than, say, seltzer water, uh, because you'd probably be less likely to be burping during exercise. And if you really are working out and you're, you're, you're thinking about how your times of your working out, well, then that could actually impact your, your exercise performance and your timing. So I think water would be better. But in terms of rehydrating, Eh, you don't have nothing to worry about here. They're all going to work about the same. So, so much for that myth of the week. Let's now change gears, if you will, and talk about the main thing I want to talk about this week, and that is shingles. Again, this is born out of a conversation I had with my 16-year-old niece. Shingles, what is it? If you've never heard of shingles before, well, it, it is a virus infection and it causes a very painful rash. Uh, and it, basically, if you've never heard of shingles before, you may have, I'm sure many of you have heard of, chicken pox. So it turns out that shingles is the reoccurrence of the chicken pox virus. When you get infected with chicken pox, you know, you get those spots on you and, you know, it's, it's not a really fun thing to have happen to you, but eventually the chicken pox goes away and the virus stays inside of us, but it stays inside of us inactive, basically dormant. And it kind of lives, if you will, um, on the nervous tissue. Um, and, and it stays there pretty much sometimes for our entire lives. And sometimes we never even have a reoccurrence of it, but when the virus reactivates, when it, when it wakes up, if you will, that virus then travels to our skin along our nerve endings. And that is what we call shingles. Again, it's the reoccurrence of the chicken pox virus that causes a, well, in some cases, a very painful rash to occur, uh, can occur almost anywhere in our body, but, you know, many, many times it'd be on our back, our chest, our neck. Uh, there's a lot of different places it can it can pop up uh, on your abdominal region, for instance, on your abs. Uh, so many different places. Uh, when my grandmother was alive, uh, I remember that she got shingles at about 102, 101, something like that. Uh, you've heard me talk about my grandmother before. She had lived to about 104 and a half. And again, when she was about 101 or so or two, she got shingles. So most likely she got to chicken pox sometime when she was a little girl and it stayed dormant for her whole life. And then basically, you know, maybe a hundred or so years later, it popped back up. 
And so, you know, sometimes that does happen and it does appear to occur more so in older people, but sometimes it can happen even in younger people, but it is very, very unlikely. Um, and so that's, again, one of the reasons I wanted to talk about this because when, you know, Wendy told me she had chicken pox, I was, you know, I was concerned because she's my niece and uh, I wanted to, you know, help her the best I possibly could. And so that's kind of what, again, what born out this, this episode. Now, risk factors for shingles. And again, I basically told you one of the big risk factors of shingles a second ago, and that is being older. Uh, shingles, the risk of getting this disorder increases after the age of 50. And some people have actually estimated that about half, half of people over the age of 80 will have shingles at some point in their life. So as we get older, the likelihood of getting shingles will actually increase. And again, generally, it's rare in younger people. And why is it? Why is it that shingles might be more likely in older people than younger people? Well, I kind of have a theory. And so I have a theory of why, why this might be. But before I tell you that, I do want you to realize that if you are freaking out, as if you've never heard of shingles before, I do want you to realize that, yeah, there are vaccines against chicken pox and shingles. And that's definitely something uh, to really, really seriously consider. If, if you're in America, you probably have seen the, the shingles vaccine TV commercials. They, are, they do pop up in TV uh, a lot, I've noticed, usually in prime time. And you've probably also seen the shingles vaccine advertised even at your local pharmacy. So that's definitely something to, to take a look at, especially if you're over the age of 50 and you know, you're, you're concerned about this. And it, it, again, talk to your doctor. They can tell you much more about the shingles vaccine and even give you the shingles vaccine if that's what you want. But what are some natural things you can do to reduce your risk of getting shingles? These natural things would work in conjunction with this vaccine. So what I want to basically quickly tell you here in this week's episode is some of the things that I talked to my niece about when we when I realized that this is what she had. So the first thing I want you to realize is that the really important thing is you want to keep your immune system strong. That's really the key factor to keeping shingles dormant and never actually uh, seeing this disorder. You want to keep your immune system strong because the stronger your immune system is, the more it just you know knocks it down so it doesn't it doesn't reoccur. It knocks it you know it keeps it dormant, I should say. You know, makes it go to sleep, if you will. But it it prevents it from reoccurring. You know, decades later. So the best we can do to maintain our immune system, the better we. We can do that, the more likely we are to live a life shingles free. Now, remember that people over the age of age 50 are more likely to get shingles. Why is it that people who are older tend to get more shingles? Well, I think it's because as we get older, we tend to have weaker immune systems. I actually would go so far as to say some people's immune systems might actually become senile. And I use that word on purpose because I, I really didn't make that up. There's actually a term for this condition. It's called immunosenescence. Immunosenescence. Immuno is a reference to the immune system. Senescence is basically sciency talk for old age. So you, people have old immune systems. Their immune systems are old. They're senile, if you will. In other words, they don't work as well as they should. They don't fight off bacteria and viruses as well as they did when, when say, we were younger. And I, and, I, and I think that's something that people should be aware of. Um, I, I've talked about this previously in other episodes, but I think this immunosenescence topic is something that I, I think we need to think about, especially not you know more now because of the pandemic, but also in general, once the dust clears from, as I like to say, the zombie apocalypse, we're, there's always going to be a, a place for keeping your immune system strong. And that's kind of what I wanted to talk about here, different ways you can maintain your immune system strength. So what would actually cause someone's immune system to say get old and feeble and not work so well? Well, turns out that lack of good nutrition is one of them. And again, I wanted to bring this up and I'm going to talk about it in a second, but we know that eating well helps the immune system work better. 
We also know that a lot of older people don't eat so well. So there could be some, some connection going on here. One randomized clinical study showed that the immune systems of older folks uh, tended to be improved after they received a one-month supplementation of, di of various dietary antioxidants like vitamin E and vitamin C and vitamin A. Other research studies have shown that about 35% of people over the age, 80, of, of age 50 had at least one micronutrient deficiency, uh, which could, in fact, reduce their immune function. The micronutrients, okay, take a step back, micronutrients are fancy talk for vitamins and minerals, okay? So they call them micronutrients because we don't need as many of them as we say do need the macronutrients. The macronutrients would be uh, carbohydrates and fats and proteins. When researchers looked at quote unquote healthy older folks, and I used air quotes here, they found that about 20% of them had deficiencies in zinc, uh, about 15% had deficiencies in vitamin C, uh, about 12% had deficiencies in, in vitamin D, and other vitamins and minerals that do play a role in how well our immune functions. So I know what you're thinking. Why couldn't I just take a multivitamin and call it quits? Well, I think you can make an argument for an inexpensive multivitamin in older adults. I have no problem with that. But I don't necessarily think that's really the answer. I think a, a multivitamin may be a fine start, but I do think there is a more, can I say the word, holistic way to improve immune functioning, make your immune system a better century so it can battle off not just uh, maybe keeping the... Uh, shingles virus at bay, but also strengthening and modulating our immune system so that it basically battles other types of infections as well. So I basically got three things here that I want to throw out to you that I believe can help your immune system function better. Number one, sleep. Uh, it is definitely underrated, but uh, it definitely has immune enhancing effects. And, and I know a lot of us right now are probably, uh, as we're going through the, the pandemic, are probably staying up later and maybe sleeping a little later than we normally have to before, because many of us may not have to get up for work and or even go to school in the case of my niece. And, and so I think we tend to stay up a little bit later. And again, that can wreak havoc with our, with our sleep. So if that's you, I want you to know that not getting enough sleep can definitely put you at risk of getting shingles. And as I talked to my niece, she did kind of say to me she wasn't sleeping so well. Now, I want you to remember that when we do go to sleep, it's not like when you turn off a light switch and the light goes out, we're still functioning when we're asleep. Our brain is working. All kinds of stuff is working when we're sleeping. And it turns out that that's when the body does repair a lot of stuff that goes on during the day. One study involved uh, that I looked at when I, when I was investigating this topic involved over 130,000 people with sleep disorders. These researchers noted a higher prevalence of the herpes zoster virus. That's the virus that actually causes shingles. So they noticed a higher, a higher prevalence of this virus taking effect in people with sleeping problems than those who did not have sleeping problems. So sleeping problems appeared to make that virus more active than those who slept soundly during the night. Also, the incidence of the virus, again, manifesting itself, waking up, if you will, was greater as we got older. Again, that's more evidence that the, that the shingles virus seems to be more active as we get older. The older people got, the worse things got as well in terms of shingles. Those who were 65 years and older, for instance, had about a six times more greater likelihood of that shingles virus manifesting itself compared to, say, younger people. So obviously, this study that I just related to you doesn't technically prove that sleep protects against shingles, but it does hint that sleep is definitely important to the maintaining of the immune system. So sidebar for a moment, if you're wondering, you know, how can I sleep better? You know, there's, there's a bunch of different ways out there. I mean, you know, I'm sure a lot of you are probably aware of melatonin and stuff like that. Uh, but one thing I would, I would throw out to you is, you know, you could go get a, a pair of inexpensive blackout shades, blackout curtains, and put them in your bedroom. 
Uh, what is what does that do? Well, when we have less light coming into the room, that helps us make more melatonin. Yeah, melatonin is not just a dietary supplement. Melatonin is a hormone that actually is made in your brain. The melatonin hormone helps us fall asleep, helps us stay asleep. One other thing that I actually had started doing lately myself is uh, I, I actually have one of those uh, Alexa devices that Amazon makes, and I've, I've actually turned it into a white noise machine. If you have one of these, these Amazon gizmos, did you know that it plays a lot of different sounds? Rain sounds, train sounds, airplane noise, you know, the list goes on and on. Spaceship, it makes, it has a sound like that too. So you could just tell it, and I won't use the word again because it'll probably wake up your, you know, device because it's very, very uh, sensitive to its name. But if you were to tell it to play that sound and also then tell it to loop, if you tell it to loop, and that's the word to use, it'll loop that sound all night long and then it'll never stop. So for instance, you know, I, I, I put it on at, you know, say 10 o'clock at night and, uh, you know, sometimes I'll wake up at nine o'clock in the morning and it's still playing. So there's something to think about. You can use, obviously you can use a fan and all that. Oh, it has fan sound too. If you don't have a ceiling fan in your room, it has an oscillating fan sound. So give it a try. If you have one of these, these, these devices, um, I, I'm, I'm impressed with uh, how well of a speaker it actually has. And I just have the little tiny one. I think it's called a dot or something like that. It has a very powerful speaker. So that's something you do to help you get a better sleep. But again, getting back on track, I, I can't under, overestimate how important sleep is to maintaining your immune system functioning. So right alongside sleep, I also do want to make a case for regular physical activity exercise. Now, I'm not going to go in depth in this episode about the benefits of exercise. Um, in episode 12, for instance, I talked about a whole bunch of different ways, uh, some you may know and some you may not know, of how exercise can improve your health. And in episode 36, I did an entire episode on just exercise and the immune system. So if you did not hear about those before, go check out exercise or episode 12 and episode 36. I go into way more depth on that topic. But the point I want to get across to you here today is that yes, exercise, physical activity of any kind can improve your immune function. Yes. And, and the other point I want to get across is it doesn't appear to take a lot of exercise to ramp up the immune system either. For example, when I was researching this topic, I came across a very interesting study involving Tai Chi. Now, if you've never done Tai Chi before, it's not a difficult or challenging physical activity, okay? So it's actually pretty darn easy. In this study, 36 people over the age of 60 years old were recruited. So these were older, quote unquote, older adults, I guess you could say. Um, and basically they broke them up into a group that did Tai Chi and a group that just sit around and did nothing. And basically this was a 15 week study. All right. They did Tai Chi a few times a week for about 45 minutes a day. What did they find? Well, no surprise, I wouldn't be telling you about this if they had some crazy finding, but no surprise here. The, the people who were doing the Tai Chi, they were better. They were better at defending against the shingles reoccurrence than those who did not exercise. There was more shingles, essentially, in those who didn't exercise. There was less shingles in those who were doing the Tai Chi exercise. So, Again, bottom line here, if you want to defend against the shingles virus and getting this very painful rash, you have to do some kind of physical activity on a regular basis. And again, it doesn't have to be intense. Tai Chi is not intense at all. So you could do Tai Chi a few times a week. You could take a walk a few times a week. Again, the, it is amazing how just a little bit of physical activity appears to multiply its effects in the body in a, 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 a wide variety of different ways. So exercise on a regular basis. Again, I know that's kind of challenging for some of us if we may be cloistered indoors, depending on your state, they may have regulations. Uh, but I don't, think, I don't think anybody is saying, don't go out at all. You know, even where I am, they're telling us, okay, you can't go into the stores without a mask. That makes sense you know, due to social distancing and 
you know, if there is a lot of people, obviously wear a mask. But, uh, if you know, there's no reason why you just can't take a walk by yourself a few times a week. It's all apparently it takes uh, to keep your immune system at least strengthened enough to battle off uh, the shingles manifestation. Now, the third thing I'll talk about briefly here is what I kind of alluded to at the beginning of this episode, and that is you got to eat better. You, you got to take in more nutrients. Uh, and I think that's a problem that I think many, many people these days may have. I would imagine, um, and I actually know for a fact that people are eating more uh, junk food, if you will, uh, than they probably did prior to all the craziness that's gripping the world right now. Um, I know when I went to the supermarket last week myself, I I did notice that uh, there was quite a few cookies missing from the shelf uh, that I normally would not see. A lot of comfort foods. And how did I know that? Well, yeah, I was looking for cookies myself. <laughs> So, yeah, and that's okay. That's that's fine. I have no problem with that. But along the same lines, you've, you've got to eat some better foods also. Now, I bring this up because I want to bring something to your attention that maybe you are not thinking about. As I talked about vitamins and stuff uh, at the beginning of this episode, I want to drill down a little bit more on that right here. So researchers in London looked at the diets of about 700 people, and they found that there was a, as they said, a strong association between low fruit intake and people getting shingles. The less fruit they ate, the more greater a propensity shingles had to manifest itself. So one of the things they found in this study was those who ate less than one piece of fruit a day, excuse me, no, I take that back. Those who ate less than one piece of fruit a week, those people had three times the risk of getting shingles than those who ate three servings of fruit a day. So those who ate less than one piece of fruit a week they had three times, three times the risk of getting shingles as those who ate three pieces of fruit a day. Now, I bring this to your attention because I, I felt this study was particularly interesting because these researchers also looked at the nutritional intakes of seven different vitamins and minerals, vitamin A, they looked at how much of vitamin B6 and vitamin C they were eating, uh, vitamin E, folic acid, zinc, iron, okay? So they looked at seven different things, uh, seven different vitamins and nutrients. What I found very interesting here is none, none of these seven different nutrients was associated with getting less shingles. And I want to point your attention, this one also included zinc. Zinc's getting a lot of attention these days, along with vitamin C as being an immune booster. You know it. If you turn on, if you turn on Facebook or, or any of these uh, social media things, you're seeing lots of people talking about the benefits of zinc and, and vitamin C for bolstering the immune system and all that jazz. This study said, no, there was no association between these individual nutrients and getting less shingles. The key here was eating less fruit. People who ate less fruit got more shingles. I think that is the key. So yeah, you can take a multivitamin if you like, and I have no problem with an inexpensive multivitamin it's given you 100% of the RDA of different vitamins and minerals. I think that's perfectly fine. I got no issues with any of that. But taking a vitamin pill is not the same thing as eating an apple or an orange or even eating a salad. They're different. In the episode notes, I will put a link to my fruit and veggie smoothie recipe if you prefer to drink your vegetables. Uh, I have a little concoction that I like make up myself, which again, if, uh, that you may, you may like. It actually tastes pretty good. So generally, as I said, taking a, taking a salad or a fruit and veggie smoothie, that's not the same thing as, as, as taking a vitamin. They're different. And one of the differences between, say, multivitamins and eating food is that multivitamins usually don't contain phytonutrients. Phytonutrients are plant nutrients, plant chemicals. That's one of the big differences between a multivitamin or a pill and a salad. And yeah, yeah, I know some of you are probably saying, but I take a I take a phytonutrient dietary supplement. Yeah, 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 I got that. I know they're out there as well. 
but they're going to have less phytonutrients than the food will. They're going to have less. And there is research on some of these phytonutrient dietary supplements. There's no doubt about it. I have seen the research on them. But And if you want to take them, that's perfectly fine. But there's more phytonutrients, more plant chemicals, if you will, in the food than in a capsule. And then another advantage to, say, eating the food is that the food has fiber. Those phytonutrient dietary supplements, they don't have any fiber, at least not the ones that I have seen. And this is important because your microbiome, your microbiome, those, those, those bacteria that live in your gut, in your large intestine, well, they love to eat fiber. Fiber is the food of your microbiome. Guess what? When you eat the food, your microbiome eats that fiber in the food, in the fruits and veggies, and it basically gets what it likes, and then it makes stuff in the process. Your microbiome produce compounds. We, in turn, can use those compounds to keep our immune systems healthy and strong. Yes, this means that your microbiome health is, in fact, related to your immune system health. Those two are related. There's really no contention here. They are intimately locked in a symbiotic relationship, immune system health, microbiome health. Okay. Now I, I have covered microbiome in the past. So if you jump back to episode 16, I talk a lot more about the microbiome in there, but I wanted to just bring that to your attention and circle back on it. Because uh, if you had not heard that before, again, if this is your first time joining me, I do want you to realize your microbiome is important and we don't understand it completely yet. And we may not for a long time, but what we do know is that there is an intimate relationship between your microbiome health and your immune system health and taking individual vitamins and minerals as, as much as we do need them in small amounts, they appear to be less important for immune functioning than say eating food because the food's going to have not just, you know, the, those nutrients themselves, those vitamins, those minerals, but those plant nutrients. And that's something that a lot of vitamins and uh, multivitamin products I've seen do not have. They don't have those phytonutrients, those plant chemicals. Phyto means plant. And there are thousands of these phytonutrient compounds. And they do an array of things in our body that, again, I don't think we totally understand yet. Um, but keeping your immune system functioning well is one way that they do appear to work. And again, they probably work directly with the immune system, but they also appear to work uh, in tandem with your microbiome, which in turn further helps improve immune functioning. So let's sum all this up here. I would say, yeah, definitely I think the vaccination to the shingles virus is a great thing. So don't go and talk to your doctor that, about that. I think they can, uh, they'll be very happy to you know, explain all about that. But I also think there's evidence that maybe a more holistic approach can also help reduce your risk of getting shingles. Those steps do include getting regular exercise, eating a better diet, more fruits, more veggies, and sleeping better. There is a tremendous amount of evidence on the importance of all these things in general health. So it makes sense that they would also work to help reduce the risk of shingles as well. So what do you think about all that? Hopefully I have uh, helped assuage your maybe fears about shingles, if you will, and give you an idea that, yeah, it is possible to lower your risk of getting it. I do think that uh, eating well and exercising can go a long way to maintaining our immune sensory effects so that it'll prevent us from getting this uh, very painful condition no matter what your age is. And while I didn't talk about it here, I would also throw out that I, I do also think that stress can uh, increase the risk of, uh, of shingles as well. I, I saw different studies on this, so I didn't bring it up, but I do think there is something to it. And also, a lot of us are under a stress right now. You know, if you think about it, this is a time that none of us have ever experienced in our collective lifetimes. And I, again, going back to my grandmother, you know, she was fine until about 102 or so, and she wound up, unfortunately, in a nursing home. And that is a stress when you're in a different environment with different people eating different foods. It's just not the same. And that's when shingles manifested itself in her. And, you know, right now we're under this stress of not knowing when life will get back to normal. 
And I got to think that that stress may be more manifest, if you will, in those who may feel the most helpless. And that includes uh, not only maybe older folks who may be retired or even a nursing home, um, but also even the younger people out there, you know, including maybe my own niece. I don't know. Um, I think we all deal with stress differently. And for some, the stress of this pandemic may be greater than in others. You know, it just, it, it just depends on how we deal with that stress. And so I, I think the stress issue is something to consider, but also ask yourself, you know, how, how are you dealing with it? And even talking with friends, I think can help, or, you know, if you have a dog or a cat pet, you know, play with your animals. I think that also can help uh, that. And, you know, playing with your kids and getting outside exercise can obviously help deal with stress as well. So again, I think stress is something to consider, but if you focus on the big picture again, eating better and, you know, getting a little bit of movement, sleeping better, I do think that this can go a long way to keeping your immune system functioning properly and hopefully, hopefully reducing uh, your risk of ever encountering uh, the shingles uh, resurgence in your body. So, you know, that's that's about all I wanted to say this week. And I do hope it mattered to a lot of you out there. I, it's again, once I spoke to my niece, it, it is something that I really took an interest in uh, because I, I really wanted to try to help her the best I possibly can. So, you know, hopefully she's listening, you know, and hopefully she's, you know, taking some notes or, you know, if she is listening and she didn't take notes, just call me, you know, and we'll talk about it again. <laughs> so I will end this episode this week with uh, the quote of the week. Again, I do like to end these episodes with something uplifting this week. And uh, today is no different. So the quote this week goes like this. There are only two ways to live your life. One is as if nothing is a miracle, and the other way is if everything is a miracle. Who said that? Ironically, Albert Einstein. Until next week, same time, same channel, I'm Joe Cannon. Be safe, and where you can, try to make a difference.